I'm just gonna double check that everything's working because again, I'm like outside of my usual live streaming setup. But if you let me know in the comments that the um, audio is doing just what it should, that would be super awesome. I feel like today's stream is kind of for all the people who watch my lessons on Patreon, especially the oil painting ones, and think that like paintings are always supposed to look pristine, you know, and like always super well organized in, in every way. You know, this is going to be, um, or this is, by the way, I'll just explain briefly. So, so this is a kind of over life size head. You can see like my hand in relationship to it. Um, you know, it's quite, uh, it's quite large, a really large canvas. And this is basically after maybe four hours or so of kind of blocking in, I'm just trying to find like major color value groups and trying to identify the major planes of the head and get the painting to, to work on a very basic level before I kind of move into, you know, doing anything really serious to it. Um, so by the way, if you have any questions, I'll be like checking out the chat down here as much as possible. Uh, probably some of this is going to get a little bit absorbing, um, uh, especially because there's a tremendous amount of work to do here. Uh, but I thought maybe it's an interesting stream to do just partly because, by the way, like it's on my easel. So um, it's where my mind is at. Uh, and so I thought maybe it could be interesting for, for you folks as well. Um, but yeah, just uh, just let me know if you have whatever questions and I'm here for uh, uh, chatting about it. Otherwise, uh, I've got kind of plenty of, you know, things to to occupy a little bit my mind right now. One of the big challenges in this painting uh, that I'm dealing with is you can see right by the way, you see this color value here is a sunken in version of essentially a color value about like that. So there's patches in this that are sunken in and there's patches of this that are that are fresh. Um, and since I'm not really doing anything that's related to like finishing, I mean, we're listen, we're a long way off from finishing anything. Um, I'm just uh, kind of continuing to paint on it, you know, uh, without kind of oiling out without doing anything that, you know, could, um, yeah, kind of reveal those color values. I don't, I don't think honestly, even that they're, they're all that great. So, um, uh, yeah, they need a lot of, a lot, a lot of work. So I'm just going to keep pushing in that respect. Um, and refining anyway, some of the, the color value choices that I've got without going into anything that's, you know, maybe strictly linear or could be, you know, perceived as a, um, a kind of a, a true definition of form type of uh, situation. Let's see. MJ is asking about the difference between copying and translating. Uh, in general, in well, hmm, where where to start about the difference in that? I mean, usually when when you're you're going into a painting and your your aim is to translate, you're going to be going through a process like this. You're going to be, um, you know, changing your subject substantially in order to meet the needs, <coughs> excuse me, in order to meet the needs of the, the stage that you find yourself in. Um, whereas copying, I think really, you're, you're just going to be, um, you know, going shape to shape, um, just modeling away, you know, uh, everywhere as you go in the in the same um, with the same spirit. So uh, that's a, a topic maybe that's interesting to talk about. Like I'm trying to think of like the right forum or the right venue for that. Um, because it might occupy a little bit more kind of brain space than I, than I have while I'm painting. Um, which is, uh, <laughs> admittedly doesn't start, um, in such an expansive place anyway. <laughs> Let's see. Mikhail says, Stephen, do you like working with charcoal? I find them quite fiddly. Yeah. You know, charcoal can be nice, um, for years. I worked in charcoal and, um, I mean, charcoal was always expressed to me as being like, well, that's the place you go after you figure out what graphite is supposed to do. So, uh, the trajectory of the Academy was that you would start with graphite, of course, cause it was the easiest to control. And then you would move on from there into, uh, into charcoal. And then from charcoal, you would move on into, uh, to oil paint. 
Um, and it was very much presented as, <clears throat> it was very much presented as like those were like almost linear steps, <laughs> you know, along a, a staircase towards, you know, um, complexity and the sense that, that you would maybe not leave one behind, but for sure you are, you are climbing a ladder towards, uh, towards something that's truly expressive. Which, you know, in my feeling, of course, like all of you know anyway, if you listen to me at all, um, you know, my feeling is that there's, there's plenty inside of graphite uh, to, um, uh, to explore and to unpack for, you know, for a lifetime. Um, so if you're not a fan of charcoal, I say, don't bother, you know, I mean, you might find, by the way, that if you practice a little bit more with it, maybe, maybe you would like some of the qualities of it. Uh, not that you have to, but but there's a chance of that, and so uh, always keep maybe an open mind about you know about um, you know different materials, different mediums. I just feel like uh, each one of them has some kind of cool stuff at a different point in your um, a different point in your education, different point in your career. Let's see. Neeks is asking if I want to do an underdrawing in colored pencils, is it better to use oil or wax based pencils? Ugh, great question. I mean, I guess you're talking about this like from an archivability perspective, like if you wanted your painting to last as long as possible, what under underdrawing material would be would be best suited to to giving you that longevity that you're looking for. Uh, you know, I gotta be honest, I, I don't know uh, if anybody can shed light on that, whether I mean, I, it's really it's probably a question of adhesion. And like, which one of those would the, the the subsequent layer of paint stick to a little bit better? Um, and my my gut probably tells me that the um, well, I don't know. I mean, what what is the actual binder in the oil based ones? Uh, you know, is it? Yeah, I, I would. I hesitate. I don't think it's probably linseed oil. I mean, I wonder. I just wonder what that what that's referring to actually when they're saying oil based. If I knew more about that, maybe it, it would be. Uh, a little bit easier to offer even an opinion as it is like I don't even really have an opinion on it but uh, I'd be curious to know um, again what that what that binder is because it would sound like you know something waxy might not lead to a tremendous adhesion um, you know from the paint by the way what you're seeing now of course I'm trying to stay in a sense like very non-objective uh, with this, with this painting, I mean, which is to say, like, I don't, I don't want to start necessarily, you know, making it too realistic at the moment, you know, just because uh, there's a lot to, a lot to work on, frankly, like, there's a lot to fix and change. Um, and I need to do all of that before I kind of lock anything in. I've been working on these above life size heads for um, on and off for a couple of months now. And I've had some kind of realizations inside of that. And, and one of them is, you know, going for going for form and going for modeling too soon uh, really like locks you into a place that mm, realistically you probably not not rather be like this is a place of like immense freedom where I can change everything or anything at like any time um without much bother uh which is an ideal place to be when you're you're working on a big canvas like i want to get all of this kind of realized uh to a really advanced level before i i start to like turn the form of the nostril or something um so that's kind of where i'm at with this and that's i think in a way like maybe why the way it looks the way it does <laughs> let's see Teo Miguel said, <laughs> Tiago Miguel is saying I'm his hero. I appreciate that. And uh, Neex is asking, are you currently using any medium? I have a little medium cup at the side of my, uh, the side of my palette that you, you can't see, of course, but it's just got a few drops of linseed oil in it. And when I need the paint to flow a little bit, I just toss just a little bit of linseed oil uh, in with a brush. Reese Osborne, who I haven't heard from in ages. What's up, Reese? Uh, is asking... This is uniquely different from my perception of your styles. This exploratory, I would think it would be more frightening as an established artist. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, 
I'm not sure if I've ever gone in for, you know, not exploring or, or settling down. Um, in the end, you'll actually probably find that, that this is not going to look profoundly different from uh, many of my other paintings. It's just that the, uh, the size, the sheer scale of the, the head dictates that you can't, you can't paint it quite in the same way. I, in fact, I remember, this is like so many years ago, oh my goodness. Years and years and years ago in Florence, um, I was doing my first like really large painting. <laughs> and this was uh, um, when the sculpture studio there was at a place called Via Luna. And this was a little bit outside the, not quite outside the historic center of Florence, but um, at least on the, the kind of edge of it heading out towards um, the more kind of slightly more suburban sections um, of Florence. And it was a beautiful little studio. Like everything was painted white, of course, because it was a, a sculpture studio and they wanted light everywhere. And I always thought that was very cool because I came from the painting studios, which were, you know, basically, <laughs> basically like had shades everywhere, like blocking as much light as possible, which, you know, is kind of what you need for, for, for painting, you know, you need to really be in control of the light. Um, so I, it was for me a little bit like liberating that like, ooh, there's all this, this light floating around everywhere. And I really kind of enjoyed that about it. Anyway, long story short, I was doing a painting of a section like of the sculpture studio. I don't know, is this interesting? Do you guys even want to know like stories about my history? Maybe it's like totally boring. You just want to talk about technique. But here's the deal. Uh, I'll try and give you the synopsis of, of what it was. Um, so this was the summer of my second year at the academy and I was modeling for a portrait course. It was like a summer class um, at the academy and uh, students would come in from around the world and they would um, yeah, like they would paint there for a few weeks or whatever. And so I was staying in Florence. And so this is a way for me to like make a buck um, and and manage to like keep myself uh, in Florence for the summer instead of like going back to the States. And um, I would model during the day and I would paint during the night. <laughs> so like at the end of the, the modeling day, which like I ended at 12, I would go home and go to sleep immediately and then I would wake up around six and I'd go into the sculpture studio um, when all the students were gone to to paint there. <laughs> and so I would paint all night and then I would like just get up and like rinse and repeat essentially um, uh, trying to to complete this really, really big canvas, um, which, you know, obviously in retrospect was slightly bigger than I was able to manage. But I think that's what you're supposed to do. By the way, eventually I did finish it and, and I think it turned out as a pretty good painting. But um, uh, anyway, the point I want to make is that what what is the point I want to make? Reese was asking about experimentation um, and, and exploration and I was talking about big paintings. Anyway, whatever, I'll just finish the story because I don't remember what my point was. Uh, but the story is that that at the end of all that, um, like I said, I got appendicitis. Uh, mildly, um, the student who was in from uh, from the U.S. painting my portrait was a doctor and kind of diagnosed me while I was modeling. <laughs> so I was like having pain in my abdomen, and uh, eventually uh, I end up. So if you're getting antibiotics for something like this, if they don't take it out because they didn't take my appendix out at the hospital, uh, they just prescribe me antibiotics. You have to go to this place right near the central church in Florence and you um, uh, you go into this room and you get called into another room where there is this uh, nurse who is about probably 90 years old and she's got just stacks of the like local Florentine newspaper. And so she just sits in this room. People come in. She gets a syringe out. She takes out the antibiotic. She, she shoots you in the butt with it. And then like you go on your way. I had to do this for about uh, two weeks. <laughs> uh, but that was when I completed like my first like really big kind of major painting, um, which was way, way beyond my uh, um, my grasp at the time. But, you know, I was I was shooting for it to see uh, see if I could get there. <laughs> anyway, uh, back to um, back to interesting things. 
Mikhail says, Yim Mao Kun once said that when you're translating, you're going through a process where you choose and decide what to emphasize, and that is what makes painting more interesting than just copying. Precisely. Now, there's a lot of like, uh, I, I find a lot of the copying versus translating narrative to be centered around this translating is better than copy. Now, while that is, I think, of course, I think it is true. Um, it's very easy in the art world, you know, to prop one thing up by kind of tearing down another thing. And I'm, I'm not saying like, you know, that I, I necessarily disagree with, with this comment. In fact, I think it's, it's quite sensible and it's quite descriptive and I think it's quite good. But I mean, copying is another mode of emphasis, right? Like it's, it's, it's a way to emphasize something else, something other than what we, you know, or what we, what I, what, what in general, like naturalistic realist painters appreciate. Um, you know, so just to say, you know, I don't want, you know, I'm not, I'm not like, I don't think the world has to be like the most fair place, but I just feel like saying also, you know, people that are, you know, hyper realists, they also have an agenda, right? It's just, I think one that is like very different from our own. Anyway, that's my two cents. Great quote though. Thanks for that. Uh, thank you for that, Mikhail. Sumi Dibde says, will you be doing a procreate oil portrait after you're done with your current works just for a change? We could learn something uh, from you too. Yeah, Sumi Dib has really been lobbying for a, uh, for a procreate lesson on, on Patreon. Um, I get it. I do get it. And I've been actually thinking about doing it just because I think it would be fun to do. Um, and you know, I have been using procreate for quite a while, so I, probably there is some light that I can shed on, um, uh, on the, the process for, for folks. So I don't see, I don't see why not do it. Um, it's just a matter of like these days when I set out to like make a lesson, you know, I try to be a little bit more maybe categorical than I was early on, but maybe it's the kind of thing where I could do, you know, a little bit more of a, uh. I don't know, more of like a casual version of it or whatever, like a bit of a simplified version of it. Let's let's see what happens. Uh, and Afnan Haya says, hi from Pakistan. How do you feel when you're just starting a painting and imagining the final work? Um, it's interesting you mentioned that. I kind of feel like those two things are like a little bit separate. Like when I'm planning the work, I'm doing a lot of visualization. You know, I think visualization actually is a big part of, you know, the process that, that can kind of lead to success. I think if you visualize well, you have a good opportunity to, to reach that, that kind of goal because you, you know a little bit better where you're going actually. However, like when I'm in this moment now, I'm just kind of in the moment. I'm just doing, I'm following, you know, where, where my eye takes me and just trying to everywhere, you know, move towards being just a little bit better. Uh, so I would say maybe those two things I find, you know, I'm not, I'm not always doing both of those things at the same time, I guess, um, you know, visualizing and, uh, um, and then that leading to me like finishing or wrapping up the work. It's more that, that I go through this process of just, um, I don't know, being, being in the flow, I guess, where, I'm not, I'm not really preoccupied with, uh, you know, exactly like what, what vision I, I have. It's just kind of in the back of my mind while I'm trying to, to execute these things. Hope that makes sense. Um, MJ artwork is saying, what's the hardest pencil you use to fill in the holes in the shadows? Yeah, I can sometimes use a two H to, to fill in, uh, to fill in shadow holes. It's, more rare, but I, I do find uh, I will say that, you know, a lot of times when filling in the holes in the shadows, I do use a, a slightly harder pencil uh, just because that can um, kind of get into the holes a little bit better. And also there's this phenomenon where when you're filling holes, if you do it with a much darker pencil, like if you have uh, like a 6B value, you know, in your shadow, 
and you go in with a 6B to fill those holes, you're really actually going to be pushing that value quite a bit darker than you were before. Whereas I find like with a with an H or a 2H or even an HB or whatever, you can get into the holes with a slightly lighter value and achieve the same effect without actually kind of darkening down the shadow as a whole. Um, I'm sure that that's like really niche, but I guess what else are you folks here for, right? Other than niche conversation. Uh, let's see, Vijay Kumar says, how about a YouTube video on makeshift studio and lighting for people at home? Like how to set up lighting for an easel in still life or cast or like a temperature setup or shadow box and how it should be placed. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a good, uh, I've, I've talked about that. I'm gonna do a studio tour, I think probably pretty soon. Um, I'm just kind of gearing up to it and figuring out how I wanna do it. Um, so, so I think that, in a way will fulfill actually that that need um but it's just you know it's just one of those things that there's a million videos on the list of videos that that i i kind of need to make um so you know what it's it's on the list it's definitely on there and uh i i appreciate by the way i appreciate the request i'm glad people are like asking for for different videos because it gives me a sense of like where you're at and like what you really want to see so without that i just have to like kind of guess you know and and i can definitely and have and will like just teach you the things that i think are most useful uh but but it's great to kind of take take your temperature and see what what you guys are all about let's see oh that is a dead brush right there. Bummer. Let's see. Neex is asking, I find gesso a little too absorbent. Is there an alternative I can use to prime surfaces for oil paintings other than oil ground? Well, there is like what's called an emulsion ground. So you can, you can have basically a, an oil and gesso emulsion um, that is in between the absorbency of like a gesso ground and an oil ground. So... That's a little bit of a hybrid. Um, I'm sure there's formulas out there you can find online. I don't, I don't have one that I use. I'm just aware that, that this is a thing that people do use um, and you can use it. So, uh, so it is out there if you do like a little bit uh, of research. But it's called an emulsion or an oil immersion ground. Um, and like I said, it's kind of that combination in between the, uh, the two kind of polar opposites, which are you know, a gesso ground, which is like soaking, just soaking the oil out of your, your paintbrush. Um, and uh, a, um, an oil ground, which is obviously uh, a lot less absorbent, a lot, a lot slicker. Yeah. Which, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's just, you know, we just call it like it is. It's a, just a, a slicker ground. It's less absorbent. And that, yeah, that has an effect on how you, you'll find yourself painting on it. By the way, so I've got my palette like down here, like below my painting, which is unusual. Usually like when I'm painting on a live stream, I have my my palette like kind of up next to the the canvas, but that is not the case for now. So if you see me spending excessive amount of time just looking down at my knees, uh, just as I need to get that, need to get that color value just right, which by the way, that's what this whole kind of stage is about is just you know, dialing in just the right color values, getting a strong sense of form um, without maybe over committing to the design, you know, like there's a lot, there's a lot of things about this that from an accuracy perspective are, are wanting, but we'll get there. Tiago is asking, have you ever thought to work in illustration? Something tells me you'd be great. Maybe it's because <laughs> Tiago is being like very flattering and I appreciate it. Uh, um, I actually have done a very, very little bit of um, of illustration work on on commission. Uh, eventually, like it just happened because you know someone from uh, a uh, like a a free New York mag called the Epoch Times got in touch and uh, about like a illustration that they wanted done, and I was like, yeah, sure, you know. Like, I've never done that, so whatever. Let's, you know, let's just jump in and see what happens. Uh, I guess that's kind of how I am. But uh, so I did a couple of 
a couple of designs for them, but like eventually, eventually, I don't know. It just didn't totally do it for me in terms of like excitement. I mean, it was fun because it was new and I, I did it, you know, like I said, for I think a month or two, um, which was just a couple of projects because, you know, it was engaging. It was kind of entertaining. Um, but eventually, you know, I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. And, you know, I mean, when you're taking, because being an illustrator, right, it's like perpetually being on commission, you know, like you're kind of taking notes all the time on, um, on, on what the work is supposed to be. So you can have a vision for it and your vision for it should be good and clear and all that stuff. But in the end, you know, you're like kind of submitting for approval you know, like your work and that, by the way, I don't want to paint that as some, you know, terrible process. It's like, that's just what working in that field is. Uh, and that I eventually discovered, you know, I don't know, it's, it's not for me. I, I, I didn't really have to do it because I had a teaching gig at the time and I was just starting out my Patreon. And, you know, so I had, I had a lot going on anyway, um, uh, which meant, you know, yeah, I just didn't, I just wasn't in for it eventually. Um, but it's good to try those things out, you know, test your boundaries, see, yeah, maybe I would, by the way, maybe I would have absolutely loved it. And, uh, we'd be in a very different place right now. Um, professionally speaking, Paul Aguilar is saying Russian trained painter Ilya Mirochnik said he knows that a painting is finished when he hates it and doesn't want to look at it anymore. And I relate to it a lot. How do you know when you're done? <laughs> Yeah, it's not so much through uh, through hating something, but I, I get where you're coming from and where Ilya is coming from. But uh, usually, it's just because my enthusiasm is is done. Um, like sometimes, by the way, the correlation in between my enthusiasm being gone and the painting being resolved does not line up exactly. <laughs> And so there's times when I, you know, I just, I don't have anything more to give to a painting. And, uh, and so it just, it just stops there. It just ends in that, in that place. Yeah. Um, which can be a little bit of a bummer, but you know, you just got to accept sometimes that your idea and your execution did not correspond in a way that was fruitful and you just got to move on, you know, because otherwise, you know, you're just going to be like flogging this dead horse, you know, and you're just not going to get eventually where you, where you want it to go. You know, it's not, not every painting can be a smashing success. Sometimes you just have to kind of fail forward. And, um, I know that's tough for like students to get acquainted with that, that idea, but I think we've all kind of experienced it a little bit, you know, I, I know I certainly did as a student for sure. Let's see. Toby Michael is saying, have you ever gone to a life drawing or painting session where you've been surprised, affected by the work approach of someone you're working alongside? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, just just speaking about, you know, uh, working from life and, and those kinds of things. I mean, I, you know, for four years at the Academy, I was, uh, was working from, from life daily and, uh, um, like all day and all evening. So I was in a model room with, you know, whatever, sometimes like 14 other people. And naturally, like you get to looking at other people's work. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was a constant source of like, of inspiration to see, um, to see other people's work in the studio, you know, and I think that that fueled a little bit of my kind of omnivorous taste for, for influences, you know, like I'm, I, I love like looking at, at different work for ideas, even if that work isn't, you know, strictly within the boundaries of, of what I do, you know? Um, yeah, like I can look at a, a Jasper Johns or uh, whatever, and, and still uh, have a kind of inspiration from it, even if it's not you know, strictly representational. I think that that kind of cross pollination uh, should probably be encouraged a little bit more in ateliers. You know, um, uh, this is just you know me shouting my opinion from the rooftop a little bit, but 
you know, I think when you, you can become sometimes a little bit too insular in your views. And so you lose out on, on the variety that you can get that's like readily available out there to, to find. Let's see, Felipe Klen says, any tips to start painting? I'm shifting from a focused study of drawing, constructive principles, proportion values, and so on. I would say that um, a good place to start uh, is just with some like exercises that teach you how paint works because you may find that you're drawing really well and really proficiently but you're going to arrive at your canvas and it's going to be a different story because this stuff is like sticky, unctuous, uh, at times gross <laughs> in its character. And you've got to find a way to, to manufacture that paste into like a full on like representational image, right? Um, which is no no small feat whatsoever. Like it's incredibly challenging to do and kind of mind bending when you start to think about, you know, like all the stuff you have to do to actually like accomplish that and make that happen. So um, just start figuring out like how does a, you know, how does a sphere work in oil paint? How does, you know, this work in oil paint? How does that work in oil paint? Um, try to solve some, some basic problems and then kind of get into um, maybe the more complex ones, which... By the way, of course, that's what, so next month, by the way, next month on Patreon, I'm following up on the advanced cast drawing and I'm gonna be doing, uh, I'm gonna be giving a, a lesson on how to kind of finish your advanced cast drawing with, uh, with white chalk and all that stuff, right? Um, following up from that, like the, 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 the next month, we're gonna be starting the um, uh, sphere project with a, grisaille painted sphere um, and this is very much going to be a lesson uh, aimed at people for whom oil paint is not they're not like 100 percent confident in oil paint which i would say probably arguably everybody will say that they're a little bit uncomfortable with oil paint if you're if you're saying to yourself i'm 100 percent comfortable with oil paint and i know everything about how it works uh <laughs> chances are you probably uh, do with like a good um, a good lesson uh, because I, I mean even I feel you know like there's still a lot that I can learn about you know stuff that that oil paint does just for, for kind of frame of reference there um, but anyway the point is uh, spheres are coming up and this is exactly the kind of basic project uh, that can hopefully help you uh, and everybody out there to kind of conquer uh, that or, or get over that hurdle uh, that stands in between drawing and uh, an oil painting. Um, and in a way, like it's a project that I always kind of wished I had had, like I kind of jumped right into cast painting with, uh, with oil. And, you know, I mean, I made it through, but uh, I think that the, the process of, of adaptation could have been smoother. And so that's what I'm going to do for, uh, for my Patreon subscribers is try to give them a leg up in terms of translating their drawing skills into, you know, fully fledged uh, painting skills. Right. So Alexandru Ivan says, hi, Stephen. I wonder if your Patreon lessons are also addressed to advanced students. Uh, I'm interested to sign up for the mentorship level, but it's always sold out. Yeah, the mentorship, I mean, you know, there's no real fix for that. Uh, you know, I mean, once people get a spot, they're really reluctant to, to let it go. Um, uh, but it does happen, you know, it happens every now and then. Um, but usually by the time I know about it, it's already been taken by, by somebody else. Because like, that's kind of how Patreon works is it just it immediately becomes available as soon as somebody unsubscribes, another person, you know, can theoretically like subscribe in that same minute if they if they wanted to um so there's not really a way i can like notify people or or like you know create a waiting list or something unfortunately it just doesn't work like that um but anyway uh are there lessons for advanced students i think that in general <laughs> for the first couple of years of patreon i think that people would always come to me saying the opposite that that essentially 
all these lessons are for people that are very advanced. What about beginners? Um, and that's what I embarked on, you know, making a lot of projects that I felt like spoke to uh, the needs of, of people kind of just starting out. Um, so are there are there advanced lessons? Yeah, there's tons of them. Um, in fact, like uh, the probably the bulk of of what is there actually is for advanced students currently. And, um, you know, that's that's what a lot of the content I'm releasing now is an answer to is to say that, hey, what about what about the people that need, you know, need to 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 get in at a slightly less advanced level uh, in a way? The atelier tier is also like kind of speaking to that as well um, so that you can get in kind of at the ground floor. You can kind of start out a little bit more at the beginning. Let's see. Mikel is saying, have you painted on a wood panel or board by adding some layers of acrylic gesso? Really want to try that since it'd be cheaper. Yeah, sure. I did that for years, actually. Um, and it, it can work really nice. Yeah. Uh, I would just say, you know, sand down your board really well and, you know, sand a little bit in between your uh, your layers. Um, so, yeah, you just get a nice, like, kind of even surface, much like you would, uh, you know, on a, um, like, on a gessoed panel or whatever. Uh, sorry, what I, what I mean. Uh, just like you would on a, on a canvas. You want, you know, you want to have, you know, a little bit of kind of smoothness. Any, you know, you, you might get this um, this urge to, you know what's the word like put a lot of texture on your your canvas or something um because it kind of looks cool in the gesso but uh depending on how you're painting that can really kind of get in your way a little bit later on so just be um uh, be mindful of that i would say let's see abenezer 96m is asking if i use linseed oil all the way through yeah, pretty much. You know, it's um, I only use linseed oil and I use not not very much of it. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't I don't tend to use any kind of complicated mediums or or really anything that's all that. Uh, what's the word like complex? I just I just try to use the simplest version of what I've got and just try to make it work, you know, using color and value and stuff. Um, I mean, that's something I can remember from very early on, like understanding is that, you know, the more stuff you add, like the more complex your variable system is. Uh, and that can that can mean actually that that your job is a little bit more challenging um, just because you're like you're throwing in like all this all this different stuff that that kind of wasn't there before, like isn't necessarily innate to the process. And then you have to kind of live by that. You got to like you know, live with whatever, whatever choices you made, like kind of going in and something you might have thought was good at the beginning winds up biting you a little bit in the end. Like, you know, for instance, using, uh, using like a mastic varnish or, um, or like a, a balsam in your medium will definitely keep your paint from sinking in quite as much. But then like later down the road, it's also going to make your painting kind of sticky uh, almost forever. Um, so it's going to like collect a lot of dust. Now, one of those is, uh, you know, immediately caused in a way by the other. So, um, that's just the kind of thing where, yeah, like you, you know, you may have thought like at the start, ha, this is a really great idea to solve this one problem, but it almost kind of creates another one. Um, so just be aware of like things like that, you know, they seem, seem like they're really clever, you know, at the time. And then later on, maybe you're a little bit less um, enamored with your with your choice. But, you know, experimentation, that's what it's all about. Let's see. Toby Michael is saying uh, the anecdotes are good. <laughs> uh, Stephen Conrad says the stories that begin with when I was in Florence are much more interesting than the ones that start with when I was. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Conrad, I don't know where you got this, but he says the stories that started with when I was in Palatka. I don't even know. Have I even told about people about Palatka? I've always like mentioned that like I went to this tiny art school in North Florida. Uh, um, I don't know if I ever mentioned it by name, but yeah, <laughs> Stephen Conrad got it. Yeah, I was at, a, at an art school in Palatka. 
um, which is a tiny town in North Florida that's got a, a paper mill. All right, let me tell you, let me tell you a story about Palatka. <laughs> just to, just to prove that Palatka can be maybe kind of interesting too. Um, so in my first year at college, uh, by the way, um, just for the sake of trivia, I uh, actually moved up to college on a Greyhound bus with one box and one bag of stuff. Um, and I left Miami at like five o'clock in the morning. It was like still dark out uh, on a Greyhound bus and just moved up to, to college and uh, kind of never looked back. But um, so I was, I was working at this subway, uh, like subway sandwich shop, right? And I was having, I was like the closer because I would go to school all day and then I'd have to work like all night, right? So I'd get off work at, you know, I think by this time I was working at one of the ones closer to the center of town and uh, it closed up at, at like midnight or so. Um, but I'm in the shop like closing down and, and like the way it works, it's such a stupid story. The way it works is that at Subway, right? If you're really slow in the evening, like not a lot of customers, you can actually do a lot of the closing up work kind of beforehand, you know? And, and so when you're, you're ready to close, you just walk out the door. There's a lot of work to do. Um, so you're always just kind of waiting around for like, hoping that, you know, 20 minutes before midnight, like nobody comes in. Like that's the dream uh, if, you're, if you're working at Subway. And so this night was like pretty slow and then like, literally like a couple minutes before I was ready to close a couple of minutes before midnight this guy comes in and I'm just like in in abject misery about this I'm just like oh my god this is like the worst thing that could have happened I'm so tired I just want to like go home I want to stop making sandwiches <laughs> and so this guy comes in and uh I I have my heart on my sleeve, you know, like, and he can tell that I'd rather be elsewhere. Um, and I'm just kind of like, I'm just looking bummed out. I'm looking sad and like, he can see it. Right. Um, now, like I said, don't forget, there is a paper mill in this town, right? Which is a, just, it's a horrible place to, it smells awful. The whole town smells like paper mill. It's terrible. So he says to me to like, cheer me up. Right. He's like, don't worry, kid. You know, you keep working hard, keep your head down. You'll get out to the you'll get out to the mill one of these days. You know, like this is like the big aspiration to get out to the mill. And I just I mean, I couldn't say anything, you know. I mean, he was by the way, bless his heart. He was just trying to cheer up this like bummed out kid. He didn't know like why I was, he didn't know I was bummed because he was there. Um, but it was like crushing to think. If I work really, really hard, one day I'll make it out to the mill. Nothing against people that work at mills, but I, I, I wanted to be doing something. I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a professional at, at that. And it was not my ambition to be uh, working at a paper mill. Anyway, that's my, that's my story that starts with uh, once upon a time when I was in Palatka. I hope it didn't uh, let you down, Stephen. Uh, Surya Darnal says... You can certainly paint, uh, yeah, uh, was commenting actually to Mikhail about um, painting on wood panels with gesso. Hey, uh, so 4566 Iggy uh, is asking when the paper, the oil painting paper from Legion comes out. I actually just uh, got done with an email chain with uh, someone in their um, marketing administration, uh, administrative department. And they're saying it's mid-November. They're just waiting to get the paper in um, and get it out to distributors. Uh, but it is it is happening. It's a thing. The project is on. Um, and I'll be obviously providing links and uh, um, spreading the, uh, the the word about um, about Stonehenge's or rather uh, Legion's new uh, new paper. I'm super excited about it. Uh, and um, I'm sure all of you that, that get a chance to to use it. Are going to be really quite satisfied again i am paid absolutely nothing by them i've just i've used their paper for so long and i kind of trust it i trust them as manufacturers um like i like their product so uh so i don't mind i don't mind talking about it in fact usually i'll say this i actually don't like to all right so let's let's peel back the curtain a little bit um so like 
once you're a certain size on on social media naturally you know different brands will get in touch with you and um say hey do you want to you know use this product which basically they're saying like hey do you want to you know do you want to kind of mention our product to the people that 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 listen to what you have to say uh in general i don't like that arrangement um especially because most of the time these are just like do you know what cold calling is you know it's like when you don't know somebody at all and you just like call them up and try to like sell them something usually like that's what it is it's just like some random company you know that saw my account and was like hey let's see if we can get that guy to like talk about our stuff and then you know we can sell our stuff um usually what comes out of that um because uh, when i first when this first happened a couple you know places got in touch and i was like I don't know, sure, like send me something if you want to. Um, but usually what they do is they'll send like some, you know, box of just like kind of random stuff. And I, I don't use random stuff. Like I have, as all of you know, like my materials lists are extensive and specific. And uh, so it just never, it was never like a thing that could work. Like I would need only like really specific materials. And a lot of times they just want to give you whatever random overstock that they have at their at their warehouse. Um, so usually it's not a fit. But then the cool thing that can happen is that if you use a particular you know product or particular manufacturer's stuff for long enough, you know they kind of you know they're out there on social media too, and they'll like see you and see that your work, and you'll they'll see that you mention them or whatever. Um, like I. I've been answering the question, like, what paper do you use? I've been saying Stonehenge for like, whatever, 10 years, you know? Um, and so when, when they get in touch and it's something that you really work with and you really use, like, it's just such a relief. It's such a nice thing to be able to say like, yeah, they're great. I'm working with them. They asked me for feedback on their products and it's a really, really cool relationship. Um, uh, and, you know, I can't say enough how much I appreciate uh, what, uh, what they do over there. Anyway, whatever. You guys don't want to hear about that. Um, let's see. A comment from someone with a screen name, why are you existing says I took 10 days to complete a one foot by two foot painting. Any tips on time management? Uh, I don't know. That sounds like you did it really fast. <laughs> like maybe you could give me a tip on time management. <laughs> Usually takes me uh, a lot longer like to, um, yeah, to, uh, to, to make a painting like this is maybe four feet across or something. Anyway, it's like 80 centimeters by, by like 50 centimeters. So for me, this is like quite a large, uh, quite a large canvas. Um, most of the work that I do is quite a bit smaller, but I've just had this ambition for a while to, to paint some, some like basically just paint some larger canvases. I've had these like ideas that keep like kind of popping up, you know, and I, I've not as of yet, like had the, the right moment to do anything about it. But like, here I am now I have the right moment. So I'm taking some time away, admittedly from other projects that I have that that need to be worked on to to paint some of this stuff, which, um, you know, hey, if I didn't have time to do that every now and again, I would think that I've, I've, you know, I've been, I've mismanaged my, uh, my career. So, um, it's taking me away from some pressing projects, but, uh, I think naturally I'm, I'm very gratified by, by being able to work on, on stuff like, uh, like this. So overall it is a net benefit. Let's see. Mikhail is asking, oh yeah, he's uh, answering somebody else. MJ is asking you, so you intentionally avoid pushing your pencil darks uh, to how far they're able to. Yeah, I've said for years, you know, when I get the, the question, how do you avoid, you know, graphite shining? You know, it's pretty simple as I just, I don't, I don't push out to the complete end of the spectrum of range that, that you have. Like you can go really dark with graphite, but you know what's going to happen when you do. It's, it's, it's going to get like shiny. So you can either get really dark uh, and be shiny or you can not get so dark and not be shiny. So I just always chose, 
you know, not being, not getting so dark, um, just because I didn't want to sacrifice in a way the, the nice kind of even tone that, uh, that, that I get by, by it not being so, so shiny. Um, but that is my default setting for, uh, yeah, for, for graphite drawings. Yeah. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Beth is saying, uh, while we're lobbying and she's talking about, um, people asking for different kinds of videos. Uh, she says, I would like to ask about more anatomy videos. Oh, anatomy videos. Yeah. You know what I've got? Here's, here's the deal. Let me tell you something about anatomy videos. I think this, and this, this especially applies to like online learning. Um, this is something I've, you know, through years so far of like working with people, uh, um, online students, there's good information, but a lot of times, even, even if the information wasn't as good, if it was more accessible, it would be more useful to people, right? So I've been saying, you know, with like my video editors and people that I work with, like that content is only good as it is accessible. Uh, meaning that if you have great content, but the user interface is really bad, nobody's going to be able to, to see or use or extract things from your, your great content. So kind of what's the point now with anatomy, I've said for years that like, if you're going to do it, and I mean, you know, even, you know, when I was teaching it, like in, in person, you have to be kind of somewhat, if you say like, I'm going to teach anatomy, it's you start talking about a comprehensive course. Um, but I've been trying to figure out like, what, what could you do that's kind of like a little bit more bite size? What can you do to make it more accessible, you know, both to the skill level, but also to like the timetable that, you know, your, your online student might have. Cause again, like I could come at you with like a, a, you know, 800 hour course, but are you going, like how much of that are you going to assimilate? Now yeah, the argument could be a lot and that's fair. Um, but I want to start out, I want to start out by trying to bring together, uh, maybe some more bite-sized, uh, anatomy lessons and see what we can get with that. Because I feel like you know, you, you kind of do need to get your foot in the door a little bit with anatomy courses, you know, just dumping somebody into the deep end, you know, there's so much that you need to know in order to learn anatomy. Well, um, you know, like when I, when I first taught uh, anatomy at the, the Florence Academy, for instance, it was a first year course. So, you know, I get people that were coming in who, who frankly, like they, they didn't have drawing skills or at least, you know, a lot of drawing skills. Um, and so, their ability to learn the anatomy was a little bit compromised by the fact that they, di they didn't yet really know very well how to draw. That's not like a, to blame them to say, Oh, you should know how to draw or whatever to be elitist about it, but just to say you're learning this anatomy so that you can draw it. If you don't yet know how to draw, you're not going to be like incorporating the anatomy lessons into your drawing. It's just going to be like, um, another like knowledge base. That's like kind of free floating. Um, which again, you know, I mean, maybe that's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but I, I mean, I wouldn't want to teach something that is, uh, an alternative to the worst thing in the world. I want to teach something in a way that is like highly applicable to, to what you're doing. So eventually we moved anatomy to being a, a second year course. Uh, so that students would be coming into class, uh, having understood things like shadow and light and uh, design and blocking in and having somewhat of a process and so on. Um, uh, and I think that 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 really helped a lot in terms of people's ability to um, immediately uh, apply and internalize the the lessons that they were getting uh, in, in my class. So anyway, that's the super long story that you didn't ask for. Uh, about where I'm at in terms of uh, anatomy classes. But yeah, there's, there's, they're definitely in like the pipeline. They're definitely in my mind. You know, it's a, um, again, it's, it's a, it's a subject I worked with for, for a long time and, and I have a deep affection for. So there's no reason not to do it. Uh, that's for sure. 
Let's see. Let's see. Emmanuel Alu is saying, uh, will you also release a book? I remember on Instagram when you were talking about it. Yeah, you know, listen, the book thing, folks, it is a raise your hand if you've written a book. It's a it's a long process and I'm at the very beginning stages of it. Um, uh, so so yeah, absolutely. It's coming, but it's not coming fast. Um, you know, it's going to be I don't even I don't even have a timeline to I don't even have a fake timeline to to throw out there um, that 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 could give you an indication of how long it would be. But, you know, it's not under a 12 month um, window of time. It's just uh, again, when you start to do something like, hey, I'm going to make a book. You start to think, well, well, what's the best book I can make? Like, how can I make a book that is really meaningful to people? Again, you know, the access, it's funny that, that, that you mentioned the book because um, the accessibility issue comes up again with that, right? You know, like I've got a ton of art books. Um, mostly they sit on my shelf. Uh, and I don't say that because like, I don't, I don't like art books. Or I think art, you know, having books is passe or whatever uh, uh, because we have like, you know, cell phones. I think books are great. Um, however, uh, they're going to be as good as, as the use that you can give them. And if, you know, I think some, some of these art books are like, kind of like coffee table books, you know, <laughs> like they're there to, uh, kind of look good on a table, but I, I wanted to make a text that was very, very alive. That was like a studio reference in a sense, you know, that would allow you to, you know, quickly access, you know, impactful ideas, you know, um, uh, and to crystallize them, you know, through, uh, through having really great kind of visualization. So that's, that's my, my plan. Um, but naturally when you're ambitious about something and you all know this too, um, it's going to take, it's going to take longer when you want to do something pretty cool. So that's it. Mikel is asking, how do you decide what color to use as the underpainting? Like with something like this, you know, I'm just diving in to like a full range of, excuse me, of color and value. Uh, so it's, it's almost like I'm at the buffet and, and I'm like taking a little bit of everything. Uh, so in that way, it's not, uh, it's not actually very discerning. However, uh, if I'm making a painting, that's like, um, I don't know, uh, that is, meant to go through some like really crystal clear stages. Uh, usually I just go with something that's in general, uh, relatively warm, um, but not too warm. So like a warm neutral, like a good raw umber or something, uh, and then just kind of move on onward from there. Sometimes, you know, I might find that, that I'll switch that up and use like some cooler colors, but, but in general, just like a warm, a warm neutral, uh, mostly because like, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not so much of like a, I don't do like a lot of like glazing so much. I mean, the sense that, that my, my paintings are pretty directly painted. Uh, so the underpainting, eventually I know it's, it's going to go, it's got to go because I'm going to make a painting on top of it. Uh, so, so it doesn't, for me, it doesn't have like the biggest, you know, meaningful impact, you know, like what, what underpainting color I use. If you were going to be, um doing a lot of glazing or something you might consider like a verdaccio which is like a green underpainting that you're gonna like glaze and scumble your warm temperatures uh on top of you know but that's again it's just dealer's choice you know you can kind of do that or not do that depending upon you know what your what your process is let's see Furkan, wow there's a lot of umlauts and stuff in the last name. So I'm just going to call you by your first name. Furkan is asking, how do you define the model's hair in contrast to the background, which is more or less the same color? Yeah, there's going to be, it's, in, it's a kind of cool question in that um, with this painting, which by the way, I didn't include in this stream a, a source image uh, just because in a way, like I've actually worked a lot on like did a lot of like photoshopping to get this design. It probably looks like super simple to everybody. Um, but like the design process that I did going into this was really extensive. And this is, you know, a painting that I'm making with 
a lot of kind of artistic intent. And so I just didn't feel like it was something where I wanted to put the source image out there because it's kind of it's kind of a different vibe. Whereas like all my Patreon videos, I'm so happy to to put out the um, the source images and whatever other materials I can to to help people to to work with them. So uh, yeah, this one is just a little bit different. But uh, the question the question was. Yeah, how to define the hair. Eventually, the hair is going to be just a little bit lighter. So there's like a darker halo around this edge. Um, and there's some variation out here that will have like some linear boundaries um, and then like a lighter value inside. It's kind of hard to see, again, because the painting is a little bit sunken in. But yeah, the, the hair through here actually is a little bit lighter than uh, than what's behind it. I can actually maybe take that as a, a moment to, to actually show you and like darken a little bit the... Um, uh, the background behind. So eventually like up here, we've got a really like a uh, dark, like kind of ambient value. Yeah, that's going to kind of frame the hair and, and push it out a little bit. So yeah, yeah, okay, uh, let's see. Other questions coming in. Uh, 46, 4566 Iggy says, well, you have a beginner's drawing course that helps basic perspective. So cool that you asked that. <laughs> um, so I've been working on, I think maybe I've, I've already, I think I've, I must've already talked about this, uh, just because I know I've been working on it and I've been thinking about it. Um, and it's, it's close to, to, you know, being what it's supposed to be. Uh, but I'm doing a course that is essentially Bridgman for beginners, right? So we all know Bridgman. He, um, he has a portraiture course. Well, he has a book on portraiture that I'm kind of going through line by line and um, uh, explaining everything that goes on in there. Now, Bridgman, uh, such uh, as, as his teaching was, actually very early on. Actually, all right. So let me say this. When you start with Bridgman's book, in the first page, he starts talking about that, like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I got caught in my words. Anyway, very early on, he talks to you, right, uh, in the book, as though perspective is already a skill set that you possess. So, so he's like presupposing that upon reading this book, that you have a, a grasp of basic perspective. Um, I know that for a lot of us, that's not going to be the case. And so some of the earliest exercises that I start working on or assigning uh, in that in that lesson are actually about perspective. Um, but we're going to go through them as necessity dictates. So we're not going to go like, you know, all the way deep into the world of perspective. At first, we're just going to to kind of learn enough that we can do the stuff that he's kind of asking us to do. And I feel like this makes sense in terms of how the, the, the lesson works, because what I'm trying to do is, is be a guide to Bridgman, not to like, um, yeah, to like remake a whole course myself, but to enable you to kind of learn the really cool stuff that, that he has to offer. Um, so I hope that, I hope that all makes sense. Um, because I think it's going to be a really, a really cool course when it's, when it's ready to come out. I just got to, you know, these things take so much time. Um, if you want to do them the right way, uh, <laughs> I mean, what is it like, you know, everybody, everybody over the age of like 25 knows, um, if you're going to do something and you want to do it the right way, it's going to, it's going to take a lot of time and effort. I say that because at, at 25, I didn't know that you know, everything in life was really hard. <laughs> but like, that's, that's how it goes, right? Um, anyway, uh, let's see, Madeline Pater says, for advanced students, I'd recommend to subscribe uh, to Stephen and Cornelia's Patreon page as they teach with the same fundamentals and background, but slightly different approach. This is a cool thing too, if you have the, the opportunity to uh, what Madeline's talking about is my wife, Cornelia, is also uh, a teacher. We actually started teaching a, around the same time at the academy. Uh, and she actually started teaching a year before me. And 
Uh, she also runs a Patreon page. Um, and on that Patreon page, obviously, she teaches about drawing and painting, mostly painting, uh, actually, but with a slightly different, obviously, a different take on it than, than I have, uh, which I've talked about on live streams before. Like when you go to the academy, one of the cool things is that you have different teachers that teach you the same ideas, but in a slightly different way, like with a slightly different focus. Um, now, this often causes students like a lot of trouble because they're like, wait a minute, but it sounds like you're saying a different thing and such and such was saying it to me a different way. Um, and, and a lot of times they'll frame it as a complaint, but the reality is they don't understand you're, they're getting like such a favor because they're getting a more like um, fleshed out or more well-rounded version of the story than if you get, just get it for one person. Uh, you know, a lot of times one person will maybe simplify the point they're trying to make uh, in order to, to, to convey their, their message. Um, uh, and that might, might be simplifying away something that really would have helped you to assimilate that, that idea. So uh, I think that it's, it's nothing but a good thing to get multiple perspectives. And it's why, uh, again, you know, I have this attitude about online learning and teaching in general. Um, I try not at all to like discount theories or not theories, but, but philosophies or practices that are different from mine. Uh, because I, I think they're just talking about a different part of the story. Like, I don't think that my teaching is something that, that is all that you'll ever need to know. Uh, I think that you should gather, constantly gather, um, be omnivorous with a way that you kind of consume knowledge. And um, if, you, if you do that, I think you have a great opportunity to become an independent thinker, right? Not to become somebody that can just repeat what they were told, uh, but somebody who can decide for themselves, you know, what the, uh, you know, what the expression they want to make is, what, you know, how they want to, to bring their, their images and their vision into the world. You know, if you, if you only ever learn from one person, then inevitably you're going to be like a product of what that one person knows, but also what they don't know. <laughs> anyway, that's my, uh, my, you know, I'll step down off the soapbox for a moment now. Um, and let everybody get back to it. Let's see. Reese Osborne says, um, <laughs> she's talking about uh, Palatka and the, uh, yeah, Palatka is a tough, it's a tough town. Not a place that I would recommend to tourists. <laughs> uh, Paul Aguilar is asking about watercolor tutorials. Um, you know, I get asked about it often enough that, I mean, naturally there's a chance uh, that I would do it. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's going to fall into that category of like stuff that, stuff that I can, I, wait, here's a great, here's a great thing, right? So I, I've, I've mentioned this quote before and I'm pretty sure it's Aristotle or whatever, but he said that um, those, those who can, do and those who know teach. Now I'm very much of the can camp when it comes to uh, watercolor. I can paint in watercolor, but I do not know uh, about you know all the various approaches that you can take to it. And um, you know what I mean. Like I'm I'm totally like autodidactic watercolor painter. You know I just I, I use the stuff and I try and make it do what I want it to do, and that's like the extent of my uh, abilities as a, as a watercolor painter. So could I offer something? Yeah, I could offer something for sure. Um, but the reason I haven't yet is just because I don't think that, you know, I have, I don't think I'm going to move the conversation forward a lot in terms of watercolor. Like, I'm just kind of going to tell you a little bit of what I do. And, and then, you know, you can do whatever with that. And sometimes that's enough, you know, I mean, we don't always, not every tutorial needs to be like the, the, the be all and end all of like, uh, of, of teaching and learning. Um, but you know, that's kind of how I evaluate projects usually is like, can I move the conversation forward? Do I feel like I really have, you know, a point of view, um, you know, on that, on that subject. In a lot of cases I do, you know, I have a lot to say about but oil paint and what I, you know, I think practical means of acquiring skills to, to become a, a proficient and independent painter. Um, 
you know, I, I, I don't know if that's totally true uh, for me and, and watercolor, uh, at least at the moment. So we've actually come a long way, you know, uh, in the painting so far. Uh, still really broken up. Um, and it'll require, you know, like I think several layers uh, of painting like this, but we'll, we'll see. Um, so JD Anarchy is asking, so is doing a block in just the lights? I think you're referring to the fact that like a lot of this is just the lighter values and I'm not really touching on like the, the, the shadows or the darks at the moment. Um, no, it's just there's a lot of like work to do in the, in the, in the lights. Um, and so like a lot of what, a lot of what I'm focused on right now is there, but definitely there's, there's stuff to do, uh, in the shadows as well. It's just, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to work very much in like the middle values. I don't want to, I almost don't want to like totally key the drawing, like all the way yet, or the, the drawing, the painting. Um, I want to give myself like some room to, uh, to breathe, uh, some room to explore, um, yeah, I don't want to get, I don't want to get like all the way, all the way in just yet, you know, um, I'm just trying to keep my options open a little bit. That usually means like not, not going too dark, uh, right away. Cause eventually, like, by the way, it's not difficult to go dark. Like eventually I will, <laughs> and, and the painting will get like really contrasty. Um, and then that's, that's fine. But, you know, uh, I think it's, it's, it's nice. It's pleasant actually to have that, that little bit of space left over where you're not actually like all the way in on your, your darkest values just, uh, just yet. Let's see. Yeah. Emmanuel is asking about hands in, 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 um, in portraits and whether I'll teach, uh, hand drawing. Um, at the end of the atelier tier, there will be an advanced, uh, an advanced portraiture project, which will involve a head and hands. So yes, uh, there will actually be that. Um, how much it will be like a hand drawing lesson. I'm not, I'm not sure again, like that's one of those things where I'll definitely like teach you the approach that I take and, um, and tell you all the, the ways that, uh, you know, that I, all the things that I use to, to make that, you know, my, my, you know, a drawing of hands, uh, a reality. Um, but I, I mean, I probably won't go into like an anatomy lesson on hands, for instance, like that probably won't be a part of it. But um, everything, everything practical that I feel like I need to tell you uh, uh, to execute that project, I absolutely will. Let's see. Um, Keith Chappelle is saying if one wanted to paint pastel would beginning studies in oil then transferring be time well spent or should one begin in the medium one is interested in um I don't have any experience with pastels anybody like if anybody out there is like you know worked with or studied with somebody who who is like proficient with pastels and and recommended uh, what to do about it. If you have, like, let me know in the comments, but, uh, it's just not a, it's not a world that I'm, you know, so actively in, involved in, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Mikhail is saying, I feel like the more I know, the more I don't know. Um, that is actually a stop on the road to, uh, figuring out how to do stuff. Um, you know, I, I say all the time, like reflecting back on my, my time as a student, I really and truly did not know what I didn't know. Uh, and, and, you know, the extent of that lack of knowledge was far more dramatic than I, I think I ever realized at the, uh, at the time. Uh, but looking back, I understood that like, I, I wasted so much time thinking I knew how to do something. Um, and, and therefore not, uh, not taking the right advices about it. Uh, and not everybody's going to do that. That was just, that's, that was my story, you know? Um, I think if I would have, 
understood a little bit uh, earlier, maybe the things that, that I didn't know and some of the things that were holding me back, um, then I could have had at times maybe a more fruitful uh, educational experience. But, you know, that's me. Like I always look back on stuff with a bit of a critical eye and go like, wait a minute, you know, what was wrong with that? Or why didn't I, I figure that out earlier or sooner or something, you know? Um, and sometimes it's just, it's just unavoidable. I don't think there's a way to be like the perfect student, which actually is something that I've, I've talked about over the years. I never, I don't think I've ever mentioned this in a stream before. Um, but so what, what is like the perfect student? Like what's the totally optimal student? Um, I would argue that the perfect student is actually not the perfect student. I, I don't think that as a student, you are there to literally only do exactly as you are instructed. This comes down to something I was saying earlier that when you study with somebody, you or certainly when you study closely with them, your abilities are going to be a reflection of what they know, but also of what they don't know. Um, and so if you only do ever do exactly what you're told to do, I think that that again, you're going to be in a situation where you are are limited to the experiences you've been prescribed to have. Now, that doesn't mean like the best student is like a rebel who just does whatever they want. There's a lot of conceptual space in between those two ideas of only doing ever what you're told and uh, and being like a total rebel and, uh, and and doing nothing that you're told. It's a lot of space in between those two that, that you can traverse um, before they kind of overlap. So I would just say, you know, um, don't be afraid to like branch out. Don't be afraid to try something even if like you literally, you know, like ask me about it and I say, that doesn't sound like a fruitful idea. Um, you know, there's, there's a chance that maybe I don't understand what you're proposing, or maybe there's a chance that it's just something I haven't heard of. Um, I mean, I'm just using myself as, as an example, but really like any teacher you're, you're, you're working with, you know, they know some things and there's other, some other things that they don't know. Uh, and that's great, you know, um, so, so feel free to, like experiment and explore because in a way that's what you're going to be doing when when it counts <laughs> that's what you're going to be doing when you're really out there being a professional artist is that you're going to rely on those experiences you're going to rely on those times that you tried something and it dramatically didn't work right um uh, and then you can say like definitively and emphatically that doesn't that doesn't work or it doesn't work for me at the time or that doesn't work for what I'm trying to accomplish right now. Um, yeah, so keeping your mind like super open in that respect and, uh, uh, you know, practically allowing yourself to, to explore a bit, I think is great. Let's see. Stereo SMC says, how can someone render smoothly without the texture of the paper showing up? I was practicing bar plates and I couldn't do a solid black similar in pictures, unless I do it in paint or digitally. Um, it's all about, um, in a way, uh, creating a harmony. I mean, you know, ultimately, being good with values isn't about being able to get the darkest dark or, or you know, uh, the, the most perfect even tone. It's about creating a harmony between all the values in the picture. Um, so really, like, I don't think that you should have to worry so much about like getting the perfect, like even black. Like if you can, that's great. If you can't, then you also work around that. Like that's what limitations are about. And I don't think limitations are necessarily a bad thing. I think limitations is something that we want to recognize and, and work with. You know, I was saying on Instagram the other day, you know, if you kind of embrace what graphite is like and the limitations that it has it can open up possibilities to you that you didn't you didn't even know were there um so i say like you know just take that as as a limitation that doesn't like close a door it just means that you need to get to that place by by taking a little bit of a different route you know um uh, it's really about how you manage all the other values in the in the piece 
more so than 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 becoming like too preoccupied with that with that one area. Let's see. <laughs> Iggy is asking, would you ever do a fantasy or science fiction painting stream for Patreon? <laughs> Uh, the uh, fast answer is probably not, as I would be, um, uh, I would probably totally fail miserably. Which is actually, I've been thinking, maybe I should do like a miserable failure stream. <laughs> like just take on some painting medium or something that I, that I don't know how to use or something I'm really awful with and just show you what a disaster can, uh, can look like. Um, uh, but then, you know, I don't know. <laughs> maybe that's not of it as of as as maybe that is not of as much value as I think it is. But uh, you can feel free to vote for the disaster stream if that is something that uh, that you want to see. And then there's a chance. There's always a chance that we do it. That's a little bit too light there, isn't it? I let that get a little bit too light. I can see like a little bit of this form turning now. That's kind of the place I want to get to. I want to get to, to where like, like this is where there's a lot of color variation, but it's not, um, it's not like super refined yet. Uh, and then I can kind of go into the features and start picking out like, all of those shapes and and picking out you know the all the edges that I want to pick out and stuff, um, but I'm just being really what's the word like I'm being very judicious in like how I allow myself to go in for that you know early versus uh, versus kind of waiting it out you know like even even kind of defining like the boundaries of where the eye is you know I've been kind of refraining from that a bit. Um, and even when I do it, I'm not going to do it with like a super dark value. I'm going to first uh, kind of lay that in with like a lighter, with a lighter value. Then what eventually I, I know that it is, I know that it's a darker value, but I just need to, um, I need to give myself some time and some space to figure everything out. Yeah, MJ is asking, um, what are the limitations that graphite has? Um, in general, it's, it's mostly about value. Uh, you know, I mean, every, uh, every medium is going to have like something slightly different. Graphite's cross to bear is, uh, is generally that you can't get quite as dark with it. Um, beyond that, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if there's really like a whole lot of other like true limitations with it. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't really have to be more than that. Like that's, a great limitation in and of itself. So, um, I mean, you could just, you could just stop there and say that, that basically you just can't get quite as dark. And that's, that's the, the, the primary issue, the primary problem with, uh, with graphite. Um, but let's see, uh, Marbus AAM says Proko kangaroo. So what you don't know is that, uh, Stan Prokopenko did a, I think it was live. I think it was live when this happened, but he did a live stream where he was going to be like drawing from imagination, which is not something that he practices a lot. Um, and so he just, I think he just kind of like drew some shape, some pretty kind of rando shape. Uh, and, you know, then one, like, then like started to like make something out of it. Right. Uh, and it turned out that he made this shape that was kind of like a kangaroo. Uh, but, like a really bad one <laughs> and Stan Stan's a fantastic artist great great draftsman um so like this is you know it's funny because it's an aberration because obviously what he what he does a lot is really really great so um uh, but he anyway like people because he's like a really uh popular uh YouTube personality like people really like went after him about it and really made fun of him um, I think a lot of it was in good fun, you know, um, uh, be, because I mean, listen, we've all, we've all been there where we've like, uh, drawn something and it was not at all what we had hoped it to be. Uh, so 
yeah, like you can have a laugh with somebody about, you know, maybe messing up, but, uh, but the Proko kangaroo kind of became a little bit famous, um, for, for being a little bit of a mess up. Um, or let's, let's say for being, uh, a, a reasonably big mess up. <laughs> let's just be uh, honest about it. Yeah. Let's see. Iggy's asking old Hollander, Michael Harding, um, both at different times. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, a particular pigment that, you know, Old Holland makes is really good, like their, or a particular color, let's say that uh, Old Holland's yellow-brown, um, you just can't get that in, in from Michael Harding. So, so naturally, it has to be uh, Old Holland. Uh, but then there's times where, you know, I prefer, um, I prefer Michael Harding, like, um, uh, for instance, I don't know what, I have in my palette this Michael Harding. I think the the black that I use, the ivory black that I use, is a Michael Harding. Um, I mean, it's not even like, by the way, like the most amazing black in the world. It's just, it's not bad, so I use it, um, which is a fine reason. You know, you don't always have to, you know, use the the best version of something to to get what you need from it. Uh, I think there's a little bit sometimes of like a, a cult of materials where everybody's trying to figure out like the best material to use, you know, and, uh, the debates go around and around and around. And sometimes I think like, I'd just rather be painting than trying to decide which, you know, which brand of linseed oil to use or, you know, whatever it is. Let's see. MJ artwork is saying, is it normal to have to push and pull when drawing? I find myself using the mono zero eraser a lot. Drawing and painting could roughly be described as the process of pushing and pulling, you know, um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what else you would be doing, <laughs> except for, for pushing and pulling, like, you know, and by that, what we're talking about is, um, we're talking about just like fixing mistakes, moving things back and forth until you get them into the right place. Like really everything here, you know, has to be pushed and pulled and pushed and pulled over and over and over again until you eventually get to where you're, you're supposed to go, uh, or at least the, the, as far as you can go. Um, uh, but yeah, that's what I spend probably most of my time doing painting is just pushing and pulling, you know, uh, that, and that's the idea, like in, in, in trying to stay broad uh, and not getting too specific too soon is that you hopefully don't wind up in a place where you're like forced to take, um, you know, steps back. Uh, from from where you you got to like what I want to do is get every stage to be as close to my vision as possible um, that way when I come to the end I'm just done like that's it I don't have to go and and redo everything um, you know in order to to finish it you know I've I've I spent the whole time doing that I spent the whole time you know, finding the parameters and describing the form and the color values and stuff. Uh, if you just stop like separating those stages, if you say the pushing and the pulling actually is the process, then that actually can can alleviate certain like stressors or certain uh, uh, what's the word um, uh, like resistance in in manufacturing the painting. Uh, let's see. Emmanuel is asking, are you putting a cool background, like something transparent flower or something? No, no, it's just a really bold kind of red background with a kind of a drop shadow on this side. So like over here, you'll probably get to, you know, some areas that are really like, uh, deep, deep blacks, you know? Um, yeah, but there'll be, there'll be a couple of surprises in it, but in general, yeah, it's, it's more about what's kind of in here than anything else. Uh, so, which there's an interesting story about that, that I do want to tell eventually, and I will, um, but it's not going to be on this stream. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of save that because uh, I feel like there's more meat on the bone to that story um, uh, to eventually, uh, to eventually get to. And I, I will, but I want to do like uh, proper justice to it. So for those of you who listen intently, just remember there's, um, there's a story coming actually about, you know, whether or not a portrait is really a portrait. Um, but that's as far as I'll go for now. Um, 
just because, uh, like I said, there's just there's a lot of meat on that bone, and I want to make sure that I, I kind of tell it appropriately. Uh, but I think how long have we? By the way, how long have we been at this? Um, I feel like it's been a little while. Yeah, it's been about an hour and a half. I think why don't we just call it a wrap right here, um, and just say thanks everybody for for checking out my super messy, crazy portrait painting and. Uh, I'll see you on the next live stream next Wednesday, 4 p.m. Please, by the way, before you click out of here, just hit the like button for me. And um, if you think the content's cool, then subscribe and you'll get notified every time I put something out. Um, if you want to learn about doing this stuff, patreon.com slash Stephen Bauman Artwork. You can find that in the uh, description for this video. But uh, anyway, people, thank you so much. And I am out of here. <laughs>